Hi everyone, so this is the second video for this week. Um, again, it's a kind of general interest video, so not really content for the exam. Um, and in this video, I'm going to talk about a little bit of mathematical work by uh, this man here, whose name is John Horton Conway. Um, and I've chosen this for a few reasons. Um, the first one is rather sad. Um, this is a news article from just over 10 days ago. Um, and unfortunately, John Conway passed away in the last couple of weeks as a result of contracting coronavirus, which he was not able to survive. Um, but I knew about him before because, you know, he's, he's quite a famous mathematician and he did a lot of work in recreational mathematics, which is kind of maths, which is not really a serious research topic, but you know, something which is more kind of general interest, um, often easier to understand mathematics, but which still has some quite surprising um, properties. And in this video, I'm going to talk about one of the one of his works in this area of recreational mathematics, which is related to some of the stuff we've been talking about, um, especially in calculus. Okay. Um, so he did a lot of work and, you know, in, in the mathematics community, he's most well known for his work in group theory. Um, outside of the math mathematics community, he's most well known for this uh, game of life, which is a kind of very simple simulation of um, a population uh, evolving on a two dimensional landscape. And, you know, and sometimes when he gave interviews, he says he doesn't like talking about the game of life anymore because it's all, he gets asked about it so often, he thinks um, people are ignoring his other work. Um, and for that reason, in this video, I'm not going to talk about the game of life, but I'm going to talk about some of his other work. Okay. So the thing I'm actually going to talk about is related to a theorem known as the intermediate value theorem, which is a result from real analysis. So first of all, I will explain what that theorem is. So, this is what the intermediate value theorem says. Let f of x be a continuous function. Then, for any numbers a less than b and y between f a and f b, there exists a number c with a less than c less than b such that f of c equals y. Okay, so there's a lot of information in those two sentences. So, let me go through it slowly. So, first of all, here we have a graphical representation of the function f of x. Okay, so this is the function f of x. And it's continuous, as you can see. Right, then for any numbers a less than b, so that means somewhere here you have two numbers a and b. Okay, and at these points the function takes values f of a and fb okay. and choose any y choose a y between fa and fb so you take a y somewhere here let me take y as being this point here then there will exist c in between a and b such that f of c equals y. So what that means is that if I take this y value and I go across here, then it will meet the function somewhere. Okay. So it does meet the function here, and this therefore defines the point c. Okay. Um, so I could have chosen any value of y in between f of a and f of b, and always you can find a point where the function has that value. Okay. That's what the intermediate value is saying. For any choice of y here, I can find a point somewhere between a and b which will have that value of the function f. Okay. And this obviously only works for continuous functions. Right? If I have a discontinuous function, then I could choose a function which looks something like this. Right? And then if I choose a as being the point here, and b as being the point here. I could choose y here in the middle and there is no 
point of the function which has this value. Right? So the theorem is, is false if f of x is not continuous. Right? It only works for continuous functions. Right. So um, John Horton's Conway's contribution was about the converse of this theorem. So the converse of the intermediate value theorem. So first of all, if you don't know what a converse means, Imagine you have a statement A implies B, right? The converse of that statement is that B implies A. Okay, so to take a kind of real world example, let's say the property A is that something is a football, and the property B is that it is round. Okay, so A implies B means that if it's something is a football, then it must be round. Okay, makes sense. B implies A is the opposite statement to that. Where's my point? I lost it. Okay, there it is. B implies A is the statement that if something is round, then it must be a football. Okay. Um, so in this example, you can see that the converse may not be true, even if the original statement is true, right? So all footballs are round. That's true, more or less. But it's not true that all round things are footballs. Okay. So sometimes the converse can be true and sometimes it's not true. Right? And the question we want to ask is, is the converse of the intermediate value theorem true or not? Okay. So we want to find out, is this converse true or not? Okay. So first of all, what is the converse? Well, as you see, we just swap the if-then parts of the theorem. So, rather than starting with f of x being continuous, we suppose that f of x has this property that for any numbers a less than b and y between f a and f b, there is a number c such that c takes the value y. Okay, suppose that's true. Then, does this mean that the function must be continuous? That was the, that's what the converse is saying. Okay. Um, and it kind of, if you think about it a little bit, it looks like it might be true. And the reason is, suppose that I have a function which is not continuous, right? So here is a function f of x, which is not continuous, right? Then it looks like you could always choose, find the discontinuity. So like find the point where the function is not continuous. And then choose a to be just a little bit to the left of this point, And choose b to be just a little bit to the right of this point, right? Then f a and f b are here. And clearly in this case, I can choose for y virtually anything I want in between these two values, and I won't be able to find c. Okay, so in this case, um, the the first property would be false. Okay, so that means if the first property is true, it looks like the function should be continuous, right? Because if the function were not continuous, I could take a and b here at the point where the function has a gap, and I would get a contradiction to the statement. Okay. So from that logic, it looks like the converse might be true. But actually, it turns out that the converse is not true. The converse to this theorem is false. What that means is you can find functions with this property that between a and b, you can always find c such that f of c is y, but are not continuous. Okay. Um, and what John Conway did was construct such a function. So we want to construct a function which is not continuous but still has the property that between any two points I pick, a and b, if we say that the values of the function are here and there, the values in between a and b will cover the whole range in between f of a and f of b. That's what we need. Okay. But not being continuous. Right? If it's continuous, it's easy. Right? But if it's not continuous, it's actually quite hard. And the way it works is to use the fact that a function 
you know, mathematically a function is just a way of taking one number and giving you another number. Okay, so it doesn't have to be possible to write it down in terms of x or e to the x or sine x or anything. It's just a method of taking one number and giving you another number. So therefore you can start to think about these kind of um, functions which are basically just a set of points. So there is no real requirement that um, points uh, nearby values of x have nearby values of the function. It could just be a kind of complete dust like this, and this is more or less the function that John Conway constructed. Okay. The function does take all the values between f of a and f of b, but it takes it in a very non-continuous way. Right. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this video is define this function. So define the function which does satisfy um, this first part of the intermediate value theorem. Okay, Between e, a and b, you can always find a point c where f of c is y, but this function is not continuous at all. Okay, so before I define this function, um, first of all, I need to, the function is based upon um, representations of numbers in base 13. So first of all, I just want to define what we mean by different bases. Okay, you probably know this already, but just in case I'll go over it. So usually when we write numbers, we write them in terms of base 10, right? So that means if I have a number which is, say, 206, I'm going to use as the example. You write it like this. And what does that mean? Well, the first number is the number of hundreds. The second number is the number of tens. And the third number is the number of ones, right? So 206 means 2 times 100 plus 0 times 10 plus 6 times 1. Okay? So we break the number down into powers of 10, right? This is 10 squared, this is 10 to the 1, this is 10 to the 0, okay? And if you have a decimal point, then you'd have 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, and so on, right? Okay? Um, so you, you can write down any number basically as a sum of some coefficient cn times 10 to the power n, and this cn must be somewhere between 0 and 9. Okay. Um, so I'll also do base 2 next because base 2 is uh, one that comes up quite a lot because it's used in computing. So here the idea is the same. In base 2, we want to be able to write down any number as a sum upon n of some different coefficients, let's call these a n then, times 2 to the power n, where now a n is only equal to 0 or 1. Okay. So if we take the example we had above, 206, then I would write this down as 128, because that is 2 to the power 7. plus, okay, so that gives me 80, 78 left, so next I'd have 64, which is 2 to the power 6, okay, so that gives me 180, 192, so I have 14 left, so then that would be 8 plus 4 plus 2, okay, so that's 2 to the 3, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 1, okay? So as a binary number, then, it would be 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. Zero, right? Where these 1s and zeros are the coefficients of 2 to the 7, 2 to the 6, 2 to the 5, and so on, all the way down to 2 to the 0. Okay. So this would be the representation of that number in base 2. Okay. Right, so the 
function I need to describe to you is based upon base 13 descriptions. Okay, um, so base 13, the idea is the same. We want to write any number as the sum upon n of some coefficients. Now let me use b times 13 to the power n. Okay, um, so now if we do that with 206, then then that is 13 squared, which is 169. Okay, and that leaves you 37 left. So then we'd have 26, which is 2 times 13, and that gives you 11 left. So you'd write it down in this way, right? So this is 13 squared. This is 2 times 13 to the power 1. And this is 11 times 13 to the power 0. Okay, now in this case, bn, you see in each case um, the coefficients go up to 1 minus the, sorry, the, the base you're at minus 1. So in base 10, the maximum coefficient is 9. In base 2, the maximum coefficient is 1. So therefore in base 13, the maximum coefficient is 12. Okay. Um, but now we have a notational problem because um, we want each coefficient just to be represented by a single symbol. Right? If you write the coefficient 10 as 1, 0, then you're still using base 10 to represent that coefficient, which is no good, right? because you're meant to be using base 13. So what's usually done in this case, where you have a base larger than 10, is you start to represent these as capital letters. So 10 will be represented by an A, 11 will be represented by a B, and 12 will be represented by a C. Okay. So then this 206 in this notation is 1 lot of 13 squared, 2 lots of 13, and 11 lots of 13 to the power 0, but um, 11 is represented by the symbol b. So in base 13, this number would be 1, 2, b, where this is the number of 13 squareds, this is the number of 13s, and this is the number of 1s. Okay. Right, so that's base arithmetic. arithmetic. Um, like I say, I guess you've seen that before, but we will use this fact that you can represent any real number in base 13. Right. Okay. So now let me construct this function. So it's known as Conway's base 13 function. Okay, and I'll define it first and then I'll explain why it's defined like it is. Okay, um, and we're, in this case we'll focus on numbers between 0 and 1, but that's not necessary. It could be any value of x, but just to keep things simple, um, let's suppose we have x between 0 and 1. Okay, so that means it starts by 0 point something something something, and we can take the expansion in base 13 is going to be given by something, you know, so it's going to be 0 0.16A4. So remember, A, B, C are now symbols you can have in the expansion. Um, 7B, C, 2, a, 4, 1, C, 3. Okay, there's an example. Okay. Um, and now I need to tell you what's the value of F. Okay, so to find... F, X. Okay. So, so this here is just an example, right? You know, it, it could be completely different numbers, but it will be a combination of symbols... 1 to 9, 0, A, B, and C, right? Okay, so to find the value of F on this number, what do we do? 
first thing is we, we do a kind of transformation. Okay, so we say we replace the symbol A with a decimal point. We replace the symbol B. Oh, sorry, that's wrong. You replace the symbol A with a plus sign. You replace the symbol B with a minus sign. And you replace the symbol C with a decimal point sign. Okay? So that means that this number here will give me a new symbol, right? Which is 0 0.16 plus 47 minus point. 2 plus 4, 1.3, right? So you see this looks like nonsense, right? It's just a combination of pluses and minuses and points and so on. But what you are meant to do is just look at the very end, okay? So if you ignore all the nonsense at the front, if the very end looks like a well-defined number, which here it does, 41.3, then you say that this is the value of f of x. Okay. So step two is you set f of x by the you know the rightmost part of the expansion, which gives a well-defined number. as a decimal expansion now. So we've gone from base 13 to base 10 by redefining the symbols A, B, and C. Okay, so like I say, in this example, we would set that f of x is equal to 41, sorry, plus, the plus and minus is important, so here, plus 41.3. Okay, um, but that doesn't always work, right? Because for some numbers, in fact, most numbers, the expansion doesn't have a well-defined part at all, okay? So some numbers x um, do not give well-defined answer okay so for these you simply set the function f of x equal to zero okay um, so what doesn't give a well-defined answer I could take the function which is zero point a a a a a and just have the a's going on forever Right? That's a well-defined number in, sorry, that's a well-defined number in base 13 in the same way like 0 0.33333, right, is a well-defined number in base 10, which is a third in this case. So in fact, this number here is equal to 10 over, th no, it's 9th, isn't it, 12? 10 over 12, 5 sixths. I think it's 5 sixths in base 13. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And, and this clearly doesn't have a well-defined um, number after you do this um, re re replacement of A and B and C, right? Because once you do this replacement of A and B and C, this number is just going to become 0 dot plus 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 and the plus is just gone forever, and that's meaningless, right? So for this number, you would set it simply equal to zero, the function. Okay. But for some numbers, it's well defined. Right, now, the claim is that this function, obviously, is not continuous, right? I hope that's obvious, um, because the, the way it's defined, there is no sense of continuity, but I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. And also, it does satisfy 
this second property in the intermediate value theorem, that between any a and b, the function f takes whatever value you want. Okay. So I'll prove those two claims now. Okay, um, so first for the claim that the function is not continuous. Um, and in fact, it's not continuous anywhere. So it's not continuous for any value of x at all. Okay. Um, so I won't prove this uh, properly because that would take a bit too much time, but I will explain why it should be clear that that's true. Uh, if I take a value of x, so 1, 4, 6, A, 3, B, 2, 0, C, 1, 2, 5, 9, okay, um, then what's the value of F here? Well, again, we just replace A with a plus, B with a minus, C with a dot, Okay, and just take the last, sorry, not six, nine, take the last part of that number, which is well defined, which clearly here is going to be that. Okay, so that is going to be f of x. And I can find a number which is very, very close to f, but which is so very, very close to x, but the value of f can be totally different. Okay, um, I can take a value y, so let's suppose I wanted to find a, a point close to x which has a value of f which is a thousand out, okay? So then what I can do is I can just take y equals exactly the same stuff at the beginning Okay, that's exactly the same as x, okay, and then if x here is zeros I can put in as many zeros as I like to make y as close to x as I want. And then I can just put in something which breaks the sequence, for example, two a's. Okay, And then I can put a completely different number. So I can put 1,000, then c and 0, let's say. Okay then the value of f on this number, because here, I won't bother writing out the front all again, because I've got two a's now, this double plus here breaks the sequence, so whatever is to the left of that here doesn't matter at all, okay? And all that matters here is that we have 1,000.0, and therefore the value of f of x, f of y, is 1,000, which is totally different to the value of f of x. Okay? And it's clear by adding as many zeros as I want here, I can make the point y as close to the point x as I want. Okay? I can make the point y as close to x as I want. At the same time, I can make the value f of y as different from the value f of x as I want. Okay? So restricting x and y close together does not restrict the values of the functions f of x and f of y at all. And this means that the function cannot be continuous. Okay, so that's all I'll say about that claim. You can turn this into a rigorous mathematical proof, um, but like I say, it will take a bit of time to give you all the definitions and so on, so I won't do that. The second claim, then, is that f satisfies this property that for any point y and a and b, a less than b, we can find a point C which is in between A and B such that F of C equals Y. Okay. Okay, so again like I won't prove it but I'll give you an example which will be clear how you can turn this into a proof for any values of a and b. 
So let's suppose that A, again, in base 13 is, you know, 0 0.12 A, 3, C, 4, B, 7. Doesn't matter. Um, and let's take the point B as being more than that. So 0 0.1. 3, 9, 7, 6, okay, and so on. Then, and let's take y as being, so y here you should give in base 10, right? Because the, the function f returns numbers in a base 10 representation. So these two numbers, yeah, that's important to specify. These two numbers are written in base 13. This last one, y, will be written in base 10. Okay, but obviously that doesn't matter. I can choose whatever base I want to write the number in. So let's take y as being equal to a thousand because we already did that in the previous example. Then all I have to do to complete this is choose any number between a and b. So I could take the number 0 0.130 right that clearly lies in between the points a and b and then i want this to the function f to give me the value a thousand so i just use the same trick as i did above i break the expansion by putting two a's together which means that everything to the left hand side of the two a's is ignored by the function f and then i just put the value i want which is a thousand and you have to put point zero um, Okay, and then, you know, after the mapping, this becomes 0 0.130 plus plus 1000.0. Just need a tiny bit more paper. There we go. Um, and therefore, the value of the function on C is given by this. f of c equals 1000.0 which is equal to y okay so there you go and obviously the same method will work no matter what a is no matter what b is no matter what y is this method is always going to work right i just choose a c which lies between a and b whatever those values are then i put a symbol to break the function expansion so for example two a's together and then after those two a's i just put the value of y that i want okay so in this case y was a thousand so after the two a's i put a thousand point zero okay for technical reasons the way you construct the function um, it should always have a point after the plus or minus sign okay but in, that's no problem because you can always put point zero if it's an integer Okay, um, and that's the end. So basically, this function f then does satisfy the first part of the converse of the intermediate value theorem. Between any a and b's, the function will take whatever value I want. But also, the function is clearly not continuous. Okay? In fact, it's not continuous at any point whatsoever. Okay. Um, and this is what a function that John Conway discovered. Um, and as I said, it's used to give a concrete example to the fact that the converse of the intermediate value theorem is false. Um, and, th and that's quite an interesting thing, because intuitively, if you think about discontinuous functions as looking like something in the picture here, like parts which are continuous and parts which are not continuous, then it looks like the converse of the intermediate value theorem should be true because, as I explained, you can always choose points A and B close to a step in the function. But the converse actually turns out to be false. Okay? And the reason is you can define a function which is not piecewise continuous like this, but actually is, is totally discontinuous at every single point um, on the real axis. And that's what John Conway's base 13 function does. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. Um, like I say, I hope it was interesting to you. It will not be on the exam, but it is closely related to some of the ideas we've seen 
about um, you know, integrability, differentiability of functions.